Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We haven't said that here at the City Club to a group in person for at least 18 months. So, our speaker today is the Chancellor of the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. He is the 10th Chancellor of the University of Illinois. Robert Jones previously served as President of the University of Albany in the SUNY State University of New York system. Following a 34-year career as a faculty member and senior administrator at the University of Minnesota. His leadership at Illinois, which is the state's flagship public research university, has seen the launch of the Carl Illinois College of Medicine, the nation's first engineering-based medical school, the recipient of two of the largest gifts in the university's history, resulting in the endowed naming of two colleges, the launch and achievement of a historic $2.25 billion fundraising campaign go more than a year ahead of schedule. And this is very important because we have suffered and continue to deal with the pandemic. The invention of a novel, affordable, accurate, and rapid COVID-19 testing ecosystem that has allowed the university to safely resume in-person instruction during the global pandemic. Bob Jones's tenure has also been distinguished by significant initiatives to increase access and affordability for all students and to foster a more diverse and inclusive university. Robert Jones created the first vice chancellor level diversity office and senior leadership position in Illinois. He established the Illinois Commitment Scholarship Program that offers four years of free tuition to nearly 2,000 Illinois families each year. Throughout his long and distinguished career, Robert Jones has worked to make education available to promising young scholars around the world. He worked with the Archbishop Desmond Tutu South African Education Program, which has educated more than 3,000 black South Africans in American universities. He's a fellow of the American Society of Agronomy and Crop Science, which means he's probably spent some time in Davenport Hall. That was a building I walked through occasionally on my way to Greg Hall or um, any of the other English building when I was a student at the U of I. And Robert Jones was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2019. With him today is his wife, Dr. Lydia Hassan Jones, who is a great radiologist, and I've just been informed that they have a daughter who is a radiologist working in Tennessee. So we're very, very proud of the Jones family. Now this is a little different um, setup that we have today. Normally people would come in, they'd be getting into the veal and chicken parmesan and so on, uh, having something to uh, drink, um, introducing themselves and talking with their neighbors. Um, but today it's a little different. We're in a different day and age. Chancellor Jones will speak and will have questions once he's through with his commentary and a brief video, I understand. And then on your way out, this is a first for the City Club, which was founded in 1903. You're going to have a package to take home with you so you don't have to turn on your oven tonight. Maybe your microwave or something, but there'll be a carry home package, probably salad, some pasta, Maggiano's famous lemon cookies, and only God knows what else. Our upcoming program on the 27th of this month, the superintendent of the Chicago Police Department, David Brown, will be our guest speaker. We welcome all of you to come back and hear what Senator Brown has to say. Uh, but today, this is all about Chancellor Robert Jones and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I'm sure there'll be a few comments about the system as well. So Chancellor, 
If I can ask you to come up. Still haven't mastered taking the mask off and without taking the glasses with her. But let me start by saying, first of all, good afternoon. It is truly a great honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak here at the City Club of Chicago today. It is a tremendous honor for me to be back at the oldest and most distinguished civic forum in this city. And having spoken here in 2019, and considering all that has transpired in the last 20 months or so, I am truly pleased to be back in this room today with about 65 to 70 of our closest personal friends <laughs> to come out and have lunch with the chancellor. Thank you for being here. It's also a great honor for me to be the speaker at the first in-person gathering of the city club since the disruption of COVID-19. You know, I realized that also that this is a hybrid audience today. So to all of you watching virtually, I just want to say sincerely thank you for being willing to spend another hour in front of a computer monitor. Thank you very much. And I also would like to just introduce two or three individuals, and I know all of you are very, very special, and you're always on a slippery slope when you start to call names. But I would be remiss if I didn't preface my comments by welcoming someone who has been 250% behind me since the day that I was named the chancellor of this great university the treasurer of the University of Illinois Board of Trustees, a icon in the city and around the world, uh, Mr. Lester McKeever. Lester, thank you so much for being here. And then next, I'd like to acknowledge someone that I got a chance to work a bit with during her long tenure as the CEO of Chicago Public Schools, someone that certainly needs no introduction, Dr. Janice Jackson. Janice, thank you for being here. And of course, my great surprise, someone that hopefully some of you have gotten a chance to meet, someone that I had the great pleasure of working with as I was transitioning from the University of Minnesota to State University of New York at Albany as president. Uh, Dr. Dr. Catherine Bertini is here as well. Catherine, where are you? Good to see you, Catherine. Had a great opportunity to work with Catherine, and she sent me a note a few months ago, and then I was very surprised to see her today, telling me that she was in this state and in this fair city. And so thank you for taking time out to come, Catherine. And then certainly, last but not least, my much, 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 much better half, my darling wife, Dr. Lynn Hassan Jones. Lynn, thank you for being here as well. And uh, Ed, I'm not one to correct the chair, but it's actually 2.25 billion with a B. <laughs> Just to set the record straight. <laughs> but anyway, we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. I think we all know that the mission of the City Club is really to provide a venue for the discussion and the debate of some of the most important public and civic matters in the city and the state and the region. And I can tell you, I cannot think of any issue that is of greater importance to our society than our progress in using the power of education to transform lives. And that transformative power will be more critical to this city in the future, more important to our nation, nation in the future than ever before, as we prepare the long rebuilding of recovery that will be necessary once this pandemic is finally behind us. I remind you, we're not there yet, but we are chipping away at this and we will certainly get there. And there is no better place to talk about the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign and our which is our state's premier research and land-grant university, 
than right here in the heart of the third largest city in America. And so we are very, very proud to be here. It's a city that, by the way, is the home to the greatest concentration of Illinois graduates on the earth. So within about a 50, 60 mile radius going south and west and north, not going east, uh, I had to correct myself as I thought about that. Within a 50, 60 mile uh, diameter or radius from here going in those directions, you will find nearly 200,000 Illinois alum. And I think that speaks testament to the power of this grand research university. Now, there's always been a very special connection between Chicago and our university. And over the course of the past few years, we have been making progress very aggressively to bring us closer together, more strategically located with a high impact presence here in greater Chicagoland. And for the last two decades, I have worked to respond to Brookings Institution leader at one time, Bruce Katz, and his observation that we certainly live in an urban age. I've come to understand that the world-class universities like ours that are located in rather small rural environments, and we're not the only one, but we must continue to deliver on our land-grant mission and the places where we were founded and where we are anchored, while at the same time to start to create partnerships and strategies that will allow us to be an equal partner in finding solutions to some of the most complex challenges in our urban core. To put it simply, folks, we have to serve the rest of the state, but we have an obligation to serve the city where the majority of the population reside. And so today's meeting coincides very nicely with the opening of our academic year at the University of Illinois. So I thought I might start off by showing you the same short video that I used to welcome our students back to the campus the day before fall classes begin. So would you please roll the video as they say. Welcome to a new year at Illinois. Some of you are joining us for the first time, returning after a year away, or continuing your Illinois experience remotely. But we all have one thing in common. We're all going to be learning what it means for us to come back together as a university community. Welcome back. As I'm sure you've gathered by now, after five years of these videos, I have no shame when it comes to making our students feel welcome at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And if you're interested in those bunny slippers, you'll have to see my wife. I scared the heck out of her when she came home and they were parked uh, under her uh, side of the bed and uh, I think it frightened her a little bit. But, but let me say, I always hope that these messages do bring a smile uh, to 
but they really do serve a very critical role and important purpose at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. They play a very big role in me introducing myself to our students and hopefully making them feel more comfortable in approaching me when they see me around the campus. So at the end of the day, I think you all would agree that I'm responsible for the decisions that impact their educational experiences, and I want them to know who to hold accountable for that. I also want them to have no hesitation in talking to me directly about those expectations and about their experiences on campus. And we believe that videos like this one have turned out to be a very effective and tool in encouraging them to do exactly that. As some folks on campus know that on most days I try to get out of my office, even if it's only for a few minutes, and take a stroll around the quad. And it is very, it's a very, very rare day when I don't have students to stop me and to say hello or to ask me questions or to even raise concerns about issues that they are finding on campus. But to be honest, they mainly ask if I'm Chancellor Jones, and then they smile and they say, I get your emails. <laughs> and then, of course, they ask if they can take a selfie with me. And of course, I always say yes, even if it means that I'm running a bit late for my next Zoom meeting, which is not entirely bad. <laughs> Some may ask, why do you do this? And to me, it's quite simple. I do it because as a university leader of a large, complex university, one of the most ironic things is just how easy it is to become disconnected and too distanced from the student, faculty, and staff who are really the heart and the spirit and the soul of institutions, that the institution that you lead. So if wearing funny bunny slippers and funny pool floats is what it takes for me and our students to feel closer together, then I can tell you that is truly worth it if it allows them to gain trust in me as the leader of their great university that they decided to enroll in. So I'm very, very excited to be here today, folks, to just tell you a little bit about these new, this new class in particular, this new arrivals at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, who arrived just about three weeks ago. Our freshman class this year, we welcome 8,000 303 new students. And I want you to have this in context. This shattered our 2019 record by more than 600 first year students. This also brings us to a record high, thank you. But I'm not done. This brings us to a record high total enrollment of 56,299 students at your University of Illinois. And to give you some context, I think when I arrived in 2016, it must have been somewhere between 46, about 47, 48,000 students. So that gives you a context in terms of how much the enrollment has grown and this does really represent educational opportunity at a massive scale and a level of excellence that we believe is unmatched any place else in the country. So more than one in five of our freshmen are from underrepresented groups, and more than one in five is also first-generation college students. You know, if anybody, thank you. If anyone had told me at this uh, I'm getting a little long in the tooth in higher education, as they say. If anybody had told me after all these years I would still be announcing people that are first-generation college students, I would have said, I doubt that's going to be the case. But we're very, very proud of that. And this is another factor that you may be interested in. We are the largest provider and continue to be the largest provider of undergraduate education across the entire state of Illinois. And that is something we take great pride in. 
I would also note that 76% of those students who are part of that 5,835 new freshmen are from the state of Illinois and 76% are from the city of Chicago. <laughs> or I should I say the Chicago metropolitan area, not to offend anyone. <laughs> this is what I mean, folks, when I say that we are closely connected to Chicago, even if we are separated by geography. We believe that this is a tremendous start to our new year and to have such a demand for an Illinois education, even as we still navigate the uncertainties of COVID-19, is both empowering and a reminder of the enormous responsibility that we have to deliver the educational experiences that our students expect, while at the same time doing everything in our power to keep each and every one of those students and every member of our community safe while they're studying and working at the University of Illinois. It has been almost 19 months since today. I sent the message to our students and our faculty and staff announcing the fact that we would be moving almost immediately to in-person in instruction and finish the 2020 academic year fully remote. It is a moment in my life that I would have never have imagined and one that frankly I still have, still have a bit of difficulty believing that it actually happened. What I want you to know is that in the course of 12 days, we had to rethink every operational aspect and every programmatic element of the university. And in the ensuing months, we truly reinvented the educational experiences at Illinois. We expanded access while not sacrificing quality. And we really did have to lay the foundation for new approaches that actually improved the university as a university. And we think that some of those improvements are going to be hardwired in to how the university thinks and is operate, operates long after this pandemic is only a distant memory. So the one common thread, and this is what Ed alluded to earlier, the one common thread across the last 19, 20 months is that every decision that we've made, every action that we have taken, was guided by one clear and unwavering purpose. And that was to maximize the safety of our students, our faculty and our staff, and members of the community around us. Our COVID-19 response and the innovations, the inventions, the advancements that have been created by Urbana-Champaign's faculty, staff, and students have not just allowed the university to move forward safely, they have saved lives across the nation and across the world and expanded the understanding of this horrible virus and provided communities and organizations across the state and the nation and around the world with the tools to replicate that model for their own, for their own safety. Just to give you a bit of historical context, the innovation at the University of Illinois, Banner Champaign, really started in the early, earliest days of the pandemic, once the pandemic arrived here in the United States, when our team of researchers and scientists reversed, engineered, and built the Illinois Rapid Vent. And in case you don't know where that is, this is a low cost, easily producible, portable emergency ventilator that runs off of air pressure that is critically important for hospitals and medical provider, providers who could keep COVID-19 patients alive even if their ICUs were being overrun with cases. It also offered a global perspective as well that we are very, very proud of because not only was it utilized to some extent here in this country, it was deployed into developing countries where electrical current may be not readily available or unreliable. 
And I can tell you of all the things that we did during COVID-19, some of you may not know, but I spent a big portion of my life in international engagement, as you heard uh, from Ed when he introduced me. So this is something that we are very, very proud of. And at the same time, our team of researchers, including biophysicists, epidemiologists, were coming together to develop new, real-time, sophisticated models to utilize our super, uh, supercomputing capabilities to actually be able to predict how the virus would spread and to understand what actions and strategies we needed to take to slow it down. These models turn out to be very integral to informing decision makers at the state level to quickly implement emergency orders and actions that flatten the curve of the virus spread in our state while others continue to see massive spikes in cases and in hospitalization. So if you want to blame anybody for the lockdown last summer, you have to blame those folks at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, for informing the governor and his staff, the people at the Illinois Public Health Department, with the data and the models that they needed to make some of the toughest decisions that they've had to make as leaders. And then last summer, part of the story that you probably haven't heard enough about. Some of you might know my outstanding provost, Andreas Kangalaris, a computer engineer, former dean of the uh, Granger uh, College of Engineering. Andreas came to my office and said, Chancellor, we need to talk. I said, yes, sir, what, what, what do we need to talk about? He said that uh, I'm hearing from a lot of students and from a lot of their parents that they want to be back on campus. But he was pretty adamant and pretty clear that in order to do that, we needed to have a robust testing protocol that our data set needed to be at least twice per week if we were gonna think about bringing our students back to any kind of hybrid protocol. And I don't know about you if the only testing protocol that was pretty prevalent at the moment was the so-called nasopharyngeal test that I affectionately call the brain swab. And it's the most uncomfortable thing I've experienced in recent history. And so we knew firsthand that a number of our colleagues that had tried to use that test, students, and faculty, and staff just wouldn't take it any more than once or twice. And so Andreas' notion was that we've got to grab the bulls by the horn here and we've got to create our own test. And so long story short, Andreas had been around the university for so many decades, he knows everyone. He reached out to Dr. Marty Burke, who is an outstanding scientist, but also the associate dean of our Carl Illinois College of Medicine, who reached out to two of his other friends, uh, Dr. Paul Hergenrother and Dr. Tim Fan two of the outstanding cancer researchers at the University of Illinois, and they pulled their three labs together. And so within a matter of weeks, folks, over 100 people from across these three laboratories and other places formed what we called or has become to be known as SHIELD, the SHIELD team. And together, they conceptualized and invented the revolutionary COVID shield saliva-based COVID-19 test that was truly a game changer, not only for the university this past year, but for many others as well. And I can tell you that does deserve a round of applause. This is not just anybody's COVID test. It is truly the most amazing COVID test any place in the world. The test is faster, it's less expensive, it's more sensitive than the ones widely available at the start of the pandemic. It was less intrusive and more easily scalable. And when offered in conjunction with the Safer Illinois Digital app, another invention by our faculty, and uh, we were able to uh, build that and build out what is called the COVID shield testing protocol that allowed us to create a whole ecosystem that involves the tracing, the contact tracing, the digital lab, and the testing into one integ uh, integrated 
ecosystem that um, really did allows us to do a more effective jobs than most other places in our peer group. And so we are very, very excited to been able to do this innovation like no other place in the country and no other place in the world. And it does my heart good to have my colleagues that actually some of them will admit that the COVID-19 test that they're doing is actually the test that we decided to put out there in the public space because it's not about patenting everything that can be patented. Part of it is about doing the public good. And that's an absolute commitment. If anything that's in my DNA, it's doing the public good, and I'm so proud to be at a university that took that to heart. This testing ecosystem allowed us to confidently bring our students back last fall uh, for in-person hybrid residential instruction. And for much of the year, I think you all know, we were testing everyone in the university about twice per week. This test is so sensitive. It allowed us to tech COVID-19, even when the viral load was extremely low, within days of becoming, of uh, contracting uh, the disease. And it allowed us therefore to quickly isolate and quarantine people before they could spread it rapidly within the university community or outside of the community. And so therefore last fall, we brought back 35,000 additional people to our community from all over the world. And eventually we saw our county's positivity rate drop by a factor of five. And I can tell you, I don't think there's a place in the country that had that kind of impact. And so we are very, very proud of that. Very, very proud of the amount of testing that we did. And just to give you a context, in fact, at one point in the year last year, we were doing about 3% of all the testing in these United States of America. 3%. And up to 40% of all the testing that was going on in the state of Illinois, and there was a several points where we were doing more testing than 10 states combined across this country. So as you can understand, it was a massive enterprise. And so at this point, since July 6th of last year, we have administered more than two and a quarter million tests since July. And that's a lot of testing, folks. And I can tell you, uh, there's a joke that I won't tell because it's being recorded, but ask me afterwards and I'll tell you about, there haven't been this much spitting in Chicago X, 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 Y, 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 Y. I'll, I'll tell you the rest of the story one-on-one. -on -one. But um, we are very, very proud of this, as you can tell. And not only does this test allow us to do testing on campus, we also further innovated, creating a partnership with the University of Illinois system and President Tim Colleen. We created a mobile laboratory that allowed us to take this test on the road and to really uh, leverage that testing capability. And certainly after the arduous process of, of getting uh, the FDA UAE, UAE uh, approval, uh, EUA approval, we uh, established within the University of Illinois system, President Colleen took the responsibility to make sure this get, would get deployed. And so under his leadership, we developed two university-related organizations, one to expand testing within the state of Illinois, and one to expand testing across the nation and across the world. So we are doing testing all the way from Maine to California and from New Zealand to the Philippines. And so the University of Illinois has both a domestic and a global presence as it relates to COVID-19 testing. And we're very, very proud of that. And uh, Dr. Jackson, I think you would appreciate the fact knowing that as of today, the COVID-19 test is being doing, done in more than 1,700 schools and numerous communities across the state of Illinois. So we're very proud. So last year, to our knowledge, we had no hospitalizations, no serious spread of the disease in the classroom, outside of the classroom. And that is huge for a place as large as the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. 
Our public health officials tells us that there was no evidence of spread from our university to the community, which is one of the greatest fears that people had in the community. You're bringing all these students back from all over the country and around the world, and they're gonna spread COVID to our community. It didn't happen. It happened in some other places not too far from here. It didn't happen at Urbana Champaign. And so we are extremely proud to be able to have that kind of success. So it is this basic success that we have last year and the infrastructure that we have built out that makes us extremely optimistic this year that we will be able to continue this academic year the way that we've started it and that we have an environment that's closer to the so-called normal that our students expect. But to be clear, you know, I don't know what the situation might be a month from now or actually even a week from now. But I can tell you I'm truly optimistic at the very high and growing daily vaccination rates among our faculty, staff, and students. Uh, and uh, when you combine that with our testing protocol and the fact that we are mandating vaccinations, we, we think that we have a very good chance of having a very safe community. But I've been talking a lot about innovation around COVID-19. That is part of my day job and consumes a considerable amount of my time, but I think it's important for me to make it clear that while COVID-19 has had a massive impact on every aspect of our university, we will, and we will continue to focus on that, but we have several points of pride as well that I'd like to remind you of before I end my comments today. And that is that this university has remained laser focused in advancing its mission of research and discovery, of community engagement and teaching in ways that are second to none. Our research enterprise nearly, uh, never really slowed down during this 20 months of this pandemic. In fact, we returned to the top spot in funding within the National Science Foundation, garnering about 1% of their sponsored research folks a budget. And folks, this is not the first time that this has happened. Actually, with the fact that we returned to this spot this year means that six out of the last seven years, we've been at the top of NSF funding, and that is something to be extremely proud of. Just as a side note, I had the opportunity to visit with the director and deputy director of NSF probably back in 2018 or so. And I said, I want to start by thanking you for allowing us and providing the support that we could be, you know, the top university in the nation and getting NSF support. And he stopped me. They stopped me at mid-sentence and say, no, we need to thank you for hiring the type of faculty and helping them and giving them the skills to be able to garner such a large share of a competitive grants process. <laughs> and of course, I'm sure that most of you or some of you have heard about the Carl Illinois College of Medicine, the first engineering-based college of medicine in the world. And we are just welcome our new class of 64 students. And so we're on the, we've received provisional accreditation. And hopefully by this time next year, we will have full accreditation for that program it truly is a game changer, and it's going to redefine for the next 150 years what the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, will be done, doing and everything from how medicine is sought to its practice to creating a technologically driven academic health center and medical ecosystem that is unique among research universities, and we're very, very proud of that. And we will be graduating our first set of MDs next spring or summer, May, June, whatever that is. <laughs> We're also very proud of uh, the work that we've done with our Humanities Institute. We've awarded, uh, they were awarded a new $5 million grant from the Andrew Mellon Foundation to lead a 16 university consortium exploring the contributions of, guess what? Humanities to the workplace. How many of you have heard the old dogma about, well, don't get a humanities degree, there's nothing you can do with it? But these folks are bringing to light that the role that the humanities play 
and driving the workforce and the role that they will play uh, in the workplace uh, now and into the future. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a few things about the Granger College of Engineering. They were, all right, we got one proud alum over there. Uh, they were named as a leading partner of two of five energy departments, Quantum Information and Science Research Center that were established this year. Two of the five. And Granger also, as you may have heard, we're very big on driving public-private partnerships, and we're so pleased to announce several months, months ago a 10-year, $200 million collaborative partnership with IBM and the state of Illinois to launch the new Discovery Accelerator Institute to foster technical skills and accelerate breakthroughs in cloud computing, AI and quantum computing, and materials discovery and sustainability. And of course, Granger is never done with excellence. They also received two out of seven new federal research institutes and in artificial intelligence, gents, uh, which will be centered here at the University of Illinois. And then of course, we were very, very pleased after a decade of drought in terms of state support, we received about $300 million, 140 million of it was to renovate Alt Gill Hall, as Ed called it, the library. <laughs> One of the most iconic buildings on campus, Ed, has been a library, it was the president's office, it was the law school, you name it, it has been it uh, at some point. It will be given a major facelift to become part of our digital sciences initiative, also combined with the complete raising and building a new structure at the Lionel Hall for the new digital sciences center and can't wait to see those cranes come on campus in a few weeks. I'll be, it's, it's kind of been noisy on campus with all the building around my office. Uh, just make sure they don't, the wrecking crane gets the right building when, <laughs> when it comes through. But that's a sign of progress uh, at the university and we're very, very poor, uh, proud of that. And of course we had the Doris Christopher gift of 45 million uh, to build a center for our extension operation, to consolidate all of them in one place. I think all of you know that Doris is a resident of this great community. She started out as a graduate of the College of Home Economics back in the good old days when we had Home Economics Department. And she will tell you her business plan was based on her experience as a extension educator and a 4-H leader. And that is what she based Pamper Chef on. And that is the impetus for her giving $45 million to help create this center for extension. <laughs> you know, I could go on and on, so let me just run through the list pretty quickly here. We'll be opening 2,400 square feet, 2,400 uh, seat facility, one of the amazing state-of-the-art teaching facility at this university. We've got great demand for computer science. We haven't been able to accommodate students the way we wanted to in the past because frankly, we didn't have the teaching space to do so. And so we're very pleased to have this uh, hybrid learning, flipped classroom, dynamic learning environment that is already serving, I think the number I saw, 36 different departments. It's not just about engineering. A group percentage of our students that come to Illinois will have to take a class in that building before they graduate. And of course, we always grateful for our dear alum, Tom Siebel, for his latest intervention, the Siebel Center for Design, that is a new facility that is gonna help bring design thinking and a very multidisciplinary approach to almost every discipline at the university. And that will be having a grand opening here uh, in a couple, three weeks or so. And we, as was mentioned, we are very, very proud that we reached our campaign goal, the largest campaign in the history of the university, the $2.25 billion. We reached it a year ahead of schedule. And I can tell you to do that during a pandemic speaks volumes about the impact that this university has had around the nation and around the world that folks dug deep and continue to buy the resources and the philanthropy that's important for us to be successful in the future. So let me just close with the following. I mentioned at the beginning of my comments that we are absolutely laser focused and committed to expanding our presence and our partnership here in Chicago. And this has been a priority for me since the day I arrived. 
And the state capital funding that I mentioned earlier included $200 million as a part of a $300 million project to create something that's never been done before, a deep collaboration with the University of Chicago to create the Chicago Quantum Exchange. And the Chicago Quantum Exchange, if you don't know what quantum is, Google it the way I did and you'll be pretty educated pretty quickly. <laughs> but it is a cutting edge idea, folks, that uh, there are so many communities, academic and research communities that are around the country who are trying, and the nation and the world, who are trying to win this quantum race. Because I can tell you, quantum computing is going to make your binary computer kind of be like the buggy and the buggy whip at one, some point in time. It will, it's a new way of doing computation and speeds that are so fast that it's hard to imagine. And so this partnership is going to be a game changer. We think it's going to be the driver for the economic vitality of the city of Chicago way into the future. But you can't do it alone. It takes places like University of Chicago and Illinois, bringing their best together to win this quantum race. And we're very much committed not only to driving science, but we are also very committed to the idea of democratization of game-changing technological strategies, that it has to benefit the broader community. So one aspect of this quantum uh, computing uh, center with Chicago is what we're calling inclusive innovation initiative to assure that underserved communities also benefit economically and educationally and are prepared for careers to participate in this quantum economy. And so we're very, very proud of all that we've done in this space. We're very, very proud of the Discovery Partners Institute and the role that the university plays in that. And just like to remind you that DPI is the next big idea that is going to help the University of Illinois and other higher education institutions have a strategic and high impact presence here in the city of Chicago to drive that economic vitality. We're so proud to be the anchor in all of that because at the end of the day, we responded to a call that people wanted your university, the University of Illinois, to have a high impact strategic presence here in Chicago. And that is our way to assure that the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign for the next 150 years and beyond will remain the engine of opportunity that transforms lives, drives discovery and innovation that's going to make Chicago a first tier city for research and innovation across a wide array of areas, but also not leave behind and be laser focused on what that means to underserved communities. I got another hour and a half to present to you, <laughs> but in the interest of time, let me wrap it up there and say I probably went on a little longer than I should, but it's a big story and darn it. I've been here five years. I start my sixth year in about two weeks. And you're going to get sick and tired of me telling it before it's over. No, nope. Chancellor, don't leave. Nope. Robert, thank you. Well, wasn't that great? And um, any of you who've ever attended or graduated from or took any courses at the U of I can really be proud of our university. There's a lot of orange and blue today. Even if you went to Western Illinois, you know, we still honor you, Jackie. I mean, you're, we're very proud of that. <laughs> so uh, um, we have time for a few questions. Before we get to our questions, though, I would like to um, introduce the members of the Board of Governors of the City Club that are here today. You know, for the last 18 months, they have really worked very hard at uh, keeping our organization going. We're a voluntary organization. We're dependent on people contributing um, in many ways, including financially, and all that money that your folks have helped bring in. Robert, you know, if they want to send a little our way, we'll set up a foundation or something, won't we, Lester? You'll figure it out because 
You're the key man when it comes to finances for the university and the city club. But I would like to introduce um, our board members today. Jackie Robinson Ivy. <laughs> Jose Sanchez. <laughs> Frank Paul. <laughs> Dan Gibbon. <laughs> o Omar Dagestani. <laughs> and is there any other member of our board here? I may have missed anyone. I don't want to slight anybody. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much. Um, we have time for questions. I know I, a couple of people submitted questions. And by the way, this program will be offered on a podcast for, uh, via WGN uh, radio, 720 on the AM dial. And I can't wait to... Go to WGN and say, here I am. You haven't seen me for 18 months, but we're back here now. Um, ah, a few questions here. Good. Let me put my glasses on. Uh, this is from Ken Hill, Chicago Pre-College Science and Engineering Program. Uh, can you suggest additional strategies to get information directly to our parents and their children about the excellent opportunities for graduates with degrees in medicine, engineering, science, computer science, and mathematics in one minute or less. And I'm only kidding about the one minute. No, one, that's, that's hard to do. But let me say, Ken, thanks for the question. It's a great question. It is absolutely a part of our desire to have a more strategic high impact presence here. And I know you know Dr. Wanda Ward, who is my Associate Chancellor for uh, Public Engagement. And Wanda is working across many different disciplines to assure that, uh, you know, we have that kind of connection. And we're very, very fortunate to have some recent funding from several different agencies that is going to allow us to do exactly that. There is a project that involves Carl Illinois College of Medicine that's going to be focused on getting more kids here in Chicago interested in medicine-related disciplines. And you know Granger has a big presence here. He's going to have a growing presence uh, in many different sectors, presence in the uh, DPI. And so you're going to be hearing more about uh, this. And one of the things that I didn't get a chance to mention is that we are going to be, I've already hired a, a new chief of staff and a, a associate chancellor who deals with pre-K through 12 initiatives so that Dr. Jackson, we can step up to the plate even more and create those seamless partnerships with organizations like yours and, and others uh, who are really helping us to understand how we need to be present to inform more people about the opportunities at the University of Illinois at Banner Champaign. It has to be more aggressive with a greater sense of urgency than we've ever had. Okay, thank you very much. Um, this question is from former student trustee and an alum of the University of Illinois, Jalen McClinton. A similar question was submitted by Melinda McIntyre with the Noble Network of Charter Schools. Um, the question is, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Urbana-Champaign campus has seen record enrollment. However, the black population has been stagnant at 5%. What's the university doing to deal with this specifically? Outreach, dollars, specialized pipeline programs, etc. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've got your video. Uh, let me say that, first of all, uh, Jalen and whoever else asked that question, I appreciate the question. But, you know, one of the things we have to do is to correct some narratives that don't exactly align with uh, what actually what has transpired at this university, uh, not over the last five years, but the last decade. The University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign has always made equity and diversity a top priority and actually during most of the last decade. 
uh, we've seen growth in the number of underrepresented students, uh, Latinx students, and uh, African American students. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID-19, is really this is the first year where we have really had a decline in the number of students. And when we inquire about why that happens, it is mainly because of the disparate impact that COVID-19 has had on black and brown communities. And notwithstanding the fact that we have increased our spending on financial aid by almost $50 million in the past five years that I've been here, we created the Illinois Commitment Program that provides free tuition and fees for anyone from a family of 67,100 or less. And notwithstanding that, we found that because of COVID, you may offer them free tuition and fees, but it's still not enough for them to bridge that financial barrier. So our plan is simply this. We're gonna to have to redouble, if not triple our efforts to make up for those 80 or so students that we lost in those communities this year and continue on the path to making education accessible and affordable. And you can't talk about the accessible and affordable piece without also talking about the results that Urbana-Champaign delivered. We're so proud to be at the top of our peer group, the Big Ten and other uh, peer groups, in terms of what we do with the students once they enroll. You won't find a place that has a higher graduation rate, a higher first year, second year retention rate than the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And so we know that there's great concern about the optics of this, but I can tell you, and I think Dr. Jackson would agree, Part of what we're uh, committed to do is to continue to do what we can as a university. But you can't depend on downstream solutions. Somebody eventually has to step up and declare that we will work collectively on upstream solutions because there's only so many students that are coming out of our school system who are actually college ready to be admitted to a university like Illinois. And folks, quietly, that number is declining precipitously. So this is a big problem. We're going to be working on both ends of it because I can tell you, I am not one to point fingers and try to blame the school systems or the teachers or the superintendents. As a leader of a university, I have a vested interest in making sure that the number of college-ready students in this state increases, not continues to decline in the path that we're on today. Thank you, Robert, and thank you for that excellent question, uh, Jalen. Um, one qu uh, we have one more question and two quick comments. This is from Dennis Mondero, who's with the Chinese Mutual Aid Association. Dennis, where are you? Oh, right over there. Okay, good. Your success is our state success. How do we persuade the legislature to provide increased funding to the university? And Dennis, I'll pay you for asking that question later. Yeah, he's on the payroll. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. And I can tell you there's not a question that's more fundamental to the future of the state of Illinois than educating its people. And uh, I think you all know that because of competing interests, just like most other or all other states uh, in this nation, state support has been declining precipitously for decades. And that was a point in time, uh, five, seven, ten years ago, in most universities where uh, the amount of income generated from tuition uh, basically exceeded that we get from the state. And so we are very, very thankful for the support that we get from the state of Illinois. And I can tell you, after a decade of not getting in capital appropriation, the first year of the Prisker administration was a game changer for us. It changed everything. But I think what is going to have to happen is that we have to do a better job of telling our story, our story of excellence and impact. And I can't think of a better year to do that and this next legislative session, where I think we've demonstrated, as we have time and time again over the last 154 years, that we are the state's land-grant university. We exist to improve the livelihood of citizens across this state. And so the value proposition is there. We've demonstrated that we're not a, 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 a place that uh, just sinks cost. We generate excellence that drives the economic vitality. Because I can tell you one of the things I didn't talk about is the number of uh, kids that graduate from our university. And more than 64, 65% of them stay here in the state of Illinois. That is going to have to increase. 
and be more common across all higher education institutions because we're bleeding young people now because they don't really see the value proposition of an Illinois education. Uh, they go to, uh, out state for a number of reasons. So I think what I'm simply saying is we need your assistance. We need the help of everybody in this room that when we submit our request to the legislature to please write your local legislators and encourage them to support the system's request to support the University of Illinois system because it's normally not about us. Some of you may not understand this, but whatever we ask for, for the University of Illinois usually means that we are also asking that to be looked at for the rest of higher education, whether you're Northern, Western, Southern, it doesn't matter. We're not the 800 pound gorilla that eats all the bananas and then retreat to our corner the way some people like to think of us. I mean, that is, that is much too common a narrative out there. We are carrying out our role as a flagship research university. And we're great, I'm as greatly concerned about the fact that uh, other universities in the 12 other systems, only about two of them are experiencing the growth and enrollment that we are experiencing. And folks, I get, that's, that doesn't make me feel good. I don't rest well at night knowing that the rest of the educational systems are suffering because we haven't been able to support institutions in the way that we need to. We haven't been able to build a comparative narrative about the value proposition that each of those institutions bring to the table and that it's a cost-effective means for students from the state of Illinois to be educated. So I plead with you that there's never been a time in our history where your involvement with the legislative process and building off of the successes that we've had at the University of Illinois, Banner Champaign, at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and Springfield, and others across the state really does warrant, in fact, should demand our fair share of support from the state to continue to drive the excellence that's necessary for our future. Thank you very much, Chancellor. And um, so Dennis, you get a hold of your representative, who I think is Teresa Ma, and you put her on notice that she's got to support our great university, okay? Cam, is that fine with you? Okay. Um, by the way, if you need a little help, my wife was the deputy director of state and local relations for the U of I for 20 years, but she's been retired for a while. She could be brought out of retirement. Of course. Okay, now, two comments and then we'll have our big drawing, I know. This is from Stephanie Lease Emmerich, who's a proud CCC member, City Club, and a U of I alumna and master's student now. Chancellor Jones, you are an indomitable, energetic, and vibrant force. <laughs> Lynn, Lynn, you you know this, okay? Who knew? Please, please share your exercise regimen, and what vitamins do you take? Well, my exercise regimen is from running from one meeting to the next, and uh, I don't know if I really take any vitamins. Uh, what is it, Lynn? You, you're the doctor in the house. I just worked there. Uh, take fish oil, multivitamin, that's about it. I try to eat right, try to get not as much exercise as I would like to. But the main goal is I'm trying to survive this thing if I can. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. And then another accolade from uh, Kate Minnie. Kate, where are you? She's over there on the far right. She's an Illini mom and a wife. She says, eternal thanks for the outstanding response to the pandemic testing. It was very comfortable and life-saving. And I think we'd all like to echo that. 